Welcome to Behind the Book. It's time now for Behind the Book. Hosted by Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Two authors with a passion for books, no filters, and limitless curiosity. Join them now to find out the real story behind your favorite books and authors. And now, Behind the Book. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Book. Karen, how are you? Anything new on your end? I'm doing great. Thank you. No, not too much new. Just writing, interviewing authors, hanging out with my friend Tess. (laughs) <laughs> Yay. We were separated for a whole week because I went on vacation. I feel like I hadn't talked to you in forever. I know. Uh, I'm uh, kind of excited because the wordsmith comes out on the 20th of September. Um, and I am insecure about every book, as you know. And I don't like people to read them if they're not fully edited and the whole thing. But I had to give it to my team, Marianne, um, who everybody knows is my assistant, and um, Heather, who works on my marketing um, packages. And Marianne wrote to me and said that she thinks it's my best work. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Yeah. And she doesn't usually say much, you know, and I try not to like say Oh, what do you think? Like, you know, as I, yes. you know, she shouldn't have to like say, oh, it's a great book if she doesn't really think so. But anyway, so I was really on a high after she said that. And then it made me excited for the release. So we'll see how it does. But that's, you know, it's the second to the last of that series and then it's done. So that's going to be, that's going to be weird for me because I've lived with these people for like three years. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you don't ask Marianne, how much do you love it? No. <laughs> I want to. I'm always like, I want to follow up. And then I tell Cliff later, like, I don't know if Marianne liked it. She didn't say that much. (laughs) If they don't use the L word, they could say, this is fantastic. And I really enjoyed it. But I'm like, oh, I don't know. They didn't say they loved it. You know? (laughs) (laughs) So they think it's crap. Oh my God, we're so crazy. (laughs) Insecure authors. Yes. Well, you know, that's when you first finish, or at least when I first finish a book, and it's complete, I feel like it's complete, and you send it to those first readers, that's really nerve-wracking. The uh, readers that know how neurotic I am will usually mm-hmm. email at some point and go, I read the first three paragraphs. <laughs> I really think it's I great. Love, I'm I mean, loving it. It's like, <laughs> it's like they know she needs a little something. I'll just throw <laughs> exactly. her something just to, so she can sleep tonight, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what is the word Smith about? It is the seventh book in the uh, Emerson Past historical series, and it's um, it's Addie's story. She's the second to the youngest Barnes child, and she's a writer. That's why she's the wordsmith, and um, she has this secret crush on her older sister's best guy friend. Best, they're just friends, but um, and she's quite a bit younger than him, and so she's just thinking there's no way that it's possible. And he, of course, just sees her as the little sister. So it's kind of a, it's it's that trope, you know, the little sister trope. But I have some fun little uh, surprises and twists in there that I think, hopefully the readers will enjoy. And it has a gorgeous cover, I have to say. I love that cover. Absolutely love that cover. You were mentioning that you found, have found two new great books you wanted to share with everybody. Yes. Uh, We often ask authors uh, if they can recommend writing or uh, business books. And there were two that I found super helpful, one of which you suggested, Elena Johnson, and we did an interview with her. She wrote- She's amazing. She is amazing. Writing and Launching a Bestseller. And I'm holding it up right now. Our listeners cannot see it, but you can test scan that I have post-it notes (laughs) throughout the book. And I've written a lot of books and launched a lot of books and some have done really well, but I still found a lot of great kernels of wisdom, different things that you can try and do um, when you're sending your book off into the world. So that one I would definitely uh, recommend. Yeah. And one thing I love about her books is they're very practical. It's not like a a con, like here's this con high concept of, you know, this marketing idea. She's like, here are some things you can do. Here's a checklist. So yeah, I I think all her, I love all her books and her group, uh, Indie Inspiration. 
with Elena Johnson. Well, she has several <laughs> business books, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is just one of them. Yes. So I yes. might have to check out yeah. some of the others. And then the yeah. other book that I read recently is Amazon Ads for Authors 2021. It's Deb Potter is the author, and she apparently updates them every year. And I have been successfully running Amazon ads, and I learned new things. So, I mean, I, cool. this would be helpful to anyone, whether you're just starting out, you don't know anything about Amazon ads, or if you've been doing it for a while, but you want to maximize your ad spend to get the most benefit from it. Um, so, again, that's Amazon ads for authors 2021 by Deb Potter. And I'll put them in the in the show notes. And I don't know Deb Potter, but if she's listening to this, thank you. I found your book really yeah. helpful. And <laughs> would you like to be on the podcast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if anybody this knows Deb we- Potter, please send her a note. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just send her an email. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we have Julianne McLean on today, and she's a friend of ours from a couple of years now. We've all known each other, and she's such a sweetheart and such a great writer and wonderful human being. So I'm sure that our listeners are going to enjoy it. Enjoy the show. Today on Behind the Book, we are super excited to have one of our dear friends, Julianne McLean on, and she is going to talk to us about her current release. She is a USA Today bestselling author of more than 30 novels, including the contemporary women's fiction Color of Heaven series. Readers have described the books as breathtaking, soulful, and uplifting, all true. McLean is a four-time Romance Writers of America Rita finalist and has won numerous awards, including the Booksellers Best Award and Reviewers Choice Award from Romantic Times. Her novels have sold millions of copies worldwide and have been published in over a dozen languages. McLean currently resides on the east coast of Canada in a lakeside home with her husband and daughter. Welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so great to be on at last. Tell us about your path to publication. Did you always want to be a novelist? No, I, I, it didn't even occur to me until I was, well, I guess I was pretty young compared to a lot of other authors that start, start later. I was about 27 and I was working as an auditor, as an accountant and, you know, not terribly happy. And uh, so I would write on the, I started writing a novel on the weekend. So I was 28, but before that I would just, I kept a diary when I was a kid. So I would write every single day, but it was just personal, you know, just teenage stuff, especially, but <laughs> and I, I kept a diary until it's like from the time I was about 12 years old until I got married. And then I stopped writing in it, but then I started writing novels. So I guess it was just in me, but it never occurred to me that it was something I could do for a living and actually make money at it. Which did take a long time, by the way, but it <laughs> finally worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And do you still have those diaries from when you were young? Have you looked at them yeah. lately? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, actually, I do. Um, I have them up in a box in the basement. And about 10 years ago, I dug them out and they were actually quite page turners, I must say. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was- like all the drama from high school and junior high and all the crushes and little love stories. And and it was like the window into the soul of a 13-year-old, which I found very fascinating because my daughter was about that age at the time. And it was like, oh, my goodness. And uh, anyway, yeah, it was quite, I must say, educational. But there's some pages I kind of would like to rip out and burn some of the things that I've said. <laughs> But otherwise, I've, I've, I've still got them in the box. I'll dig them out again when I'm 80 and be amused, I'm sure. So if someone is unfamiliar with your books, which one would you suggest they start with? I'm going to say one of the later ones, like, because I've written 40 books, or roughly, I'm actually, I've lost count now, but the first 20 were historical romances. And then the next 13 were the Color of Heaven series, which was sort of, I was getting used to writing in a contemporary voice. So now, since then, I'd say my last four or five books are just sort of, I just kind of feel like I finally, I don't want to say found my voice, but I guess I'm just more comfortable with the stories I'm writing. And I I feel like I finally figured out the thing that I really enjoy writing. So I would say t- these, these Tangled Vines or um, A Fire Sparkling, probably. So I'd love to hear, I know Karen probably would too, about your writing process we understand there's a yellow legal pad involved. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Uh, I write longhand, which is, I know it sounds very strange, and it probably does take me longer to write a book these days, but I've got all these coiled notebooks and I've been keep I keep them and they're, I mean, they're, uh, I'll edit on the, on the notebook. I use an ever sharp pencil and then I dictate the next day. I'll dictate what I wrote before. I'll wait to the end of the week and I'll dictate the entire week's worth of writing and I'll do some editing as I'm dictating. But the, the reason that I started doing that was mostly because I ha- was having shoulder issues from being hunched over the laptop and I waited way too long to get a good chair and a proper ergonomic desk. So by then, you know, I was already in agony. So I started writing longhand just to sort of sit back, recline back, and it's it's just more comfortable. And then I also found that I was more, um, I guess, organic in terms of the the ideas and the words. I would just, I would, it's easier to just let go and write and not worry about editing and not be tempted to edit and go back and fix things. So I kind of write faster. You know, I can do five pages, zip, 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 zip. But then of course you have to dictate it and then or retype stuff. And certainly in the dictation process, I end up with a lot of very strange um, gibberish that makes no sense just because the software doesn't know what I'm saying and it'll it'll pick up something (laughs) wrong and, and I'll be, you know, going to revise it and I'm looking at it on the page and I'm going, what? The goats are on the mountain? What is that about? <laughs> and, I, and I have to go back to my handwritten notes to find out what did I really say there and then fix it. So yeah, there's some stuff that takes longer, but but yeah, no, I just enjoy it. I think I'm probably going to do this forever. The handwritten hmm. longhand stuff, it's just, just feels feels better, I guess. So do you outline your novels ahead of time? I plot in advance. I wouldn't call it an outline. I usually end up with maybe a 15-page synopsis of the overall story, but I have a really solid kind of idea of the main five plot points and how it's going to, I know how it's going to end and I know what's going to happen in the middle. So, and I'm usually really, uh, I try really hard to avoid a sagging middle. So I will plot you know, so that you don't end up padding when you feel kind of desperate when you get into the middle of the book and you feel like you need to fill pages. Oftentimes you can end up filling it with stuff that's really not that necessary or not that interesting, kind of mundane. So when I outline or not outline plot in advance, I just make sure that there's, I'm not going to be tempted to go down that road because I know what I, the next plot point that I have to drive to, I can hit the gas and drive to it and not be tempted to pad and write unnecessary stuff just to fill pages. What's your approach to research? Mm -hmm. I love research. Actually, I'd say that's 50% of the fun of being an author, ordering the research books, finding the research books, reading the research books, and then (laughs) (laughs) coming. they'll give me ideas usually. Like, for instance, the, the book I'm just working on now, it's set during the Alaska earthquake in 1964, which was a real event. So, and I knew I was going to have a certain thing happen during this earthquake. So when I started reading all the people's stories about what really happened, all the little details, it ended up breathing more life into the scenes and gave me something to add to my outline. Like I thought, oh, I'm going to make this happen. And then it might drive the story in a new direction. So yeah, research plays a big part in the plotting of the story and the way the story ends up. And I I do, I must say, I do like to write books that are based on some real event that requires research, just because I find it interesting. Like after writing so many books, it can get a little old if you're writing the same thing over and over. So like, for instance, you know, researching Alaska, and we went to Alaska and traveled to Alaska. So that's part of the research as well. And that's a really fun thing to do. But the, yeah, the learning something new, I guess. So you know, I, I didn't even know about the Alaska earthquake. I sort of stumbled across it about four or five years ago. And I thought, oh, that I think I could write a story around that. And it just took me this long to actually get to it and figure out what kind, what was the story going to be. But then, of course, it re- required all this research. So you'd never been to Alaska before and you specifically went for the book. Yes. Yeah. Cool. And I pretty much, and I already had it plotted. So, and I really, once we got there, I really knew a lot about Alaska before I even got there. And but there were things I learned when we got there that were just so important for the book that I thought, oh my gosh, thank mm. goodness we came here. I wouldn't have realized this. And just the real life of of how it feels to be there and 
certain things like when does the sun set and rise, it's very different in Alaska. So little details like that, that you, that you discover when you're like, I just like to get my feet on the ground in the location that I'm writing about. Just, I guess it just gives me more confidence about to write about that stuff. Would you mind telling us about your new book, Beyond the Moonlit Sea? Sure. <laughs> okay. This one is, is about a pilot that goes missing over the Bermuda Triangle. It's actually about his wife, who starts to wonder if he's really gone because she's hearing all these theories about things that happened in the Bermuda Triangle. So it's about her journey <laughs> of letting go of her husband. But then there's lots of twists and turns about... Uh, the mystery of what actually happened to him. So we go back in time. It's a bit of a dual timeline back to like 1986, where early things in his life that happened kind of affected how he ended up over the Bermuda Triangle in the first place. So mm. uh, yeah, that was fun to write. Again, more research about the Bermuda Triangle, which was fascinating <laughs> and frightening at the same time. So at what point do you share a work in progress? Mm. Who are your first readers? Okay, so the, yes, this is one of those things that I really keep my cards close to my chest with the work in progress. I don't share it with anybody until the book is totally complete and revised that I've done my own revision and edit. So it's pretty clean and pretty polished before I show it to anybody. And my editor doesn't get it until I've already first shown it to my first reader, who is my cousin. Michelle, but she's she's not just my cousin. She's an author as well. So she has a really good and an mm. avid reader. So she has, a, she has great instincts. And if there's something that's going wrong, she can usually identify why, you know, from a, from a writing perspective, like with, if it's conflict or whatever, she, she knows about that stuff. So, so she gives it a read first, and then I do a revision from her comments. And only then do I send it to my editor. So I usually aim to finish a book at least the, the first draft at least a month in advance of the due date. Um, so when my editor gets it, she gets a pretty polished, clean version of the book. And then, of course, we do go through more edits. But, you know, I've, I always find that every single round of edits makes the book better. So the more rounds you do, the better it gets. And especially if you can put it away for a little while and come back to it with fresh eyes, which is what happens if I finish a month in advance and then my cousin reads it for two weeks, I take two weeks off and then I come back and revise and then then my editor gets it and then again it's a month later I'm working on it so you really have those fresh eyes. I'm fascinated that you have a cousin who's also a writer. Did, which one of you uh, wrote a book first? She was the one who came up with the idea to write a book and thank goodness for that. I was like thank you because honestly I don't know that I would have even thought of it. So she wrote the first three chapters of something and it was a historical romance and this is would have been back in the early 1980s and she we were just out of college and then she put it away for a really long time and then then we sort of came back we, we were really close and we were talking about it again and we both started it right around the same time writing a real first book and we worked together with each other over six years of always being each other's critique partners and at first when we started of course our you know I don't want to say our books were terrible, but, you know, they weren't great. And uh, but we helped each other develop and grow. And then we ended up selling within a month of each other. She sold her first book. Mm -hmm. I sold my first book to Harlequin and she sold hers to Dorchester, which was Zebra at the time, like a month later. So it was just so then we ended up going through the first book debut novel together. And we've just been together hand in hand for so many years. And, and she's. She's a really great writer. She's Michelle McMaster. That's who, it, <laughs> in case you're wondering, you can look her up. She's written some children's books. She's written some uh, thriller novels and historical romance. So she, she's quite uh, eclectic in her, in her talents. But yeah, so she still critiques everything. And she's going to be retiring from her day job soon uh, next year. And so she's looking forward to being more, more of a full-time writer. So when you have uh, family get-togethers, do you find that the two of you are talking shop, or can you set that aside? We have to set that aside. Okay. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, we'd end up in a corner together, and no one else would be talking to us. So yeah, no, we usually do. Usually, it's, it's we talk on the phone a lot about whatever. And all during COVID, we got together less, but every, every that happened to everybody. And we're still not back to normal, where we see each other in person as often as we used to. It's, there's lots of long two-hour conversations on the phone that happen. Mm. Yeah, still fun, but not quite the same. 
So I'm curious, when you finish a book, do you feel like it matches your initial vision of the story? I'm going to say yes to that. Yeah. Only because I plot in advance and I know what the ending is. And But there's still stuff that changes. But overall, the, the overall vision is is pretty much what I set out to do in in the beginning. So yeah, that would be a firm yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you keep a list of story ideas as they come to you? I envy <laughs> authors that can do that because I'm I I struggle to come up with an idea and I, and the, the original con like the initial concept of the story and that's probably the hardest part of the whole writing thing for me is coming up with the idea and I don't have a file folder full of ideas I got nothing I finished a book I got nothing <laughs> and I I have to like get my radar looking for some idea that kind of floats my boat and and is interesting to me and yeah the only thing that like that Alaska earthquake I've been sort of sitting on that for about four years but again I didn't have any story for it I just thought okay that that would be an interesting backdrop for a story but yeah otherwise I'm always asking my husband to keep his ear to the ground in case and so he throws stuff at me sometimes like I especially enjoy medical things like um and, and he's he's a doctor so he knows stuff and he and he reads a lot of you know, some weird stuff that's surprising. And yeah, so I'll, oftentimes I'll, he'll throw something at me and then I'll go, oh, that would make a good, make a good book. And then you have to build a story around it and flesh it out and, and all that. I've always thought it'd be handy to have a doctor in the family as a novelist. <laughs> yeah. How many times yes. test you have medical questions? Yes. Like, oh. Or a, or a cop. Yes. Yes. E- either, e- either or. Or, yeah. or a lawyer. And, yeah. A lawyer. Lawyers yes. are great. Yes. I mean, there's yep. there's times it is very very handy. I mean, besides when your daughter has an earache and he, he can look at it and you don't have to go to the ER, but <laughs> like sometimes like I'll be writing a scene and I can get really specific about something like in, in a curve in the road there was a scene where the the husband in the very early on ends up in the ER. He's had a car accident and a brain injury. And like, I can say to my husband, okay, or during a surgery, like there's a surgery happening and I'll say, okay, what would be the dialogue? What would the doctor say here? Like he's standing over the patient. What would he say to the nurses? And he'll, he'll just, you know, spout it off to me. Well, and he'll start, and I'm like, sit, like sitting there taking the notes of the dialogue. And it's usually, you know, only like five, maybe five bits of dialogue, but it's so, it's authentic and it's real. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that really, that's why I often have medical stuff in my books. And I oftentimes I would love to write a courtroom drama like they're so popular Mm. and I love reading them, but I wouldn't dare because I'm not a lawyer. And I I mean, I do have my brother in law is a a lawyer and I have friends who have been lawyers. And but I just don't feel like I could really ask the questions that I would want to ask and use them as as much as I would as I feel comfortable using my husband. (laughs) Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, you know you can't wear him out. Yeah. He he signed up for this. That's right. <laughs> and he likes it too and he he enjoys it cuz he knows, I don't know, and he, and he will read he will read my book too, but usually he reads it I don't want to say when it's too late, but it's when it's almost in the copy edit phase. He'll read it and then he'll he'll usually be able to if there's any errors, he'll spot them then, but I'm going to try to get him reading it earlier <laughs> so that I have time to change stuff. <laughs> Timing is everything. Mm. <laughs> yes, it is. So is there a writing book you'd recommend for uh, writers who are just starting out? Yes. I think probably two two books, actually. One of them would be The Hero's Journey by Christopher Vogler. Or The Writer's Journey. Sorry, it's based on The Hero's Journey. So well, The Writer's Journey, Chris Vogler. And the other one is Self-Editing for Fiction Writers. And that just ch- totally changed my prose in a good way. And, you know, they just talk about how to write dialogue and make it flow, it makes your words flow. And it's the, it's not so much in the writing process, but in the editing process. And I find that is when I make my books pretty is in the, the editing process. Like the first draft is, it's just ugly because <laughs> you're just getting the ideas down. But then I, I feel like I have a good handle on how to, you know, structure a sentence or a paragraph for the best effect that for the, what the reader's going to feel. And that comes from that book, Self-Editing for for Fiction Writers. What about marketing tips? Do you have Mm. any marketing tips for either new authors or even, you know, uh, those of us who've been around for a while? Yeah. (laughs) I have found the best way to market a book, and certainly your backlist, is to write a new book. 
and to write the best book that you can and make it really great. I feel like that's the best thing that sells books, really, is a great book. But in terms of promotion, I guess I do a fair amount of promotion, but one of my big things is BookBub. I just, I got in there early and saw what they were doing and growing my followers at BookBub is an everyday thing. Every newsletter I send out, I will end it with, oh, follow me on BookBub. And if you don't know what BookBub is, and I'll explain what it is and provide the link. And every once in a while, I'll go on my Facebook page and invite people to follow me on BookBub. And I think that's the thing that I... I know a lot of authors focus on growing their newsletter, and I do focus on that. That's very, very important. But I would, at least for me, I find BookBub is just at at the same level of importance. And if not more, because they've just got this huge subscription base. So the more followers that I have there, it it really can go to a lot more people than just my same, same readers over and over. So yeah, I think BookBub, utilize BookBub is the best, the best you can. And really like lately, I used to do a lot of other things. I do, I do a lot of advertising on promo sites like eReader News Today, and those are great. And it doesn't cost too much money to do those. And I still do those. If I want to put a book on sale, I'll, I'll do that. But applying for a BookBub featured deal, you're allowed to every 30 days. I probably do it every 45 days. I'll, as soon as it runs, I'm applying for another one. So you started out um, being traditionally published and you did some indie and your current ones are are with Lake Union. How would you say publishing has changed over the years for you? Um, I think the whole um, being able to do indie to publish books as an independent author was a, that was a huge game changer for me in a few different ways. Of course, financially, because of the royalty rate the 70% royalty instead of 8% on a print book. You make more money. This, if, if you can sell a reasonable number of books, you're going to make more money. So there's that. But the other side of the game changer was the, the creative freedom of it and being able to publish as fast or as slow as you like and not having that sense, the morale busting <laughs> um, feelings that I have had with traditional publishers early on in my career when you almost have a bit of performance anxiety when you're writing because you know that when you turn this book in and how your editor is going to feel about it or how well it sells and a lot of it may have nothing to do with you like how how well are they able to distribute this story um I just found that I I I felt like I was never measuring up and that the the bar is set really high because you're you know starting out as a as a historical romance author, there were, you know, there was some Stephanie Lawrence and Eloisa James and these superstars. And it, it took a while to reach that level. But when you're starting out and you're trying to climb that ladder and re- build your readership, it's really tough. And you, you always feel like you're never quite measuring up. And I mean, I guess we can feel that way in the indie world as well. But I have found it much easier to just focus on my own game and not worry so much about how well the author next to me is doing it because it doesn't matter. Like, because I know that all that matters is me and my readers and it's not going to break my career because if, for instance, you don't sell as well as another author and you're with a publisher, they can drop you if your sales aren't that great. So there's, back then there was this fear of my, any book could be the end of your career. And if you can't get another Mm -hmm. publisher after that, then you're no longer going to be a published author. You're going to have to go get another job. I never wanted to go get another job. So <laughs> yeah, having that option as a that you can self-publish it, even if you're trying to, to sell it to a publisher, if nobody wants it, there's a plan B, you can self-publish. And then, you know, like I said before, though, the creative freedom that I could write whatever I wanted to write, which wasn't possible either when I was started out with historical romance, because then I did write that contemporary novel, the first one, Color of Heaven, and my agent did shop it to my editors at the the traditional houses and no one was interested. They were like, no, no, she's a historical romance writer. That's all they wanted to see from me, I guess. And I was like, well, I'm just going to write this anyway because I really want to. And I did. And then I self-published it. And it was a really fun experience and did well. And it turned out making me more money than my New York books did. So I'm like, well, geez, this looks kind of fun. So I was really, really happy as an indie author and publishing all those books in a row fast because I wanted to. And it was I was just, yeah, the morale thing was huge, hugely different. 
It's liberating, isn't it, to have that creative and business freedom? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's the word. What about on those days when you're not feeling the muse? What do you do? Hmm. Well, I will take days off if I'm if I'm not feeling it. Sometimes, yeah, now I said before I'm trying to work on work-life balance because I have a tendency to write or feel that I should be writing every single day. And I do. Usually when I'm working on a first draft, I mostly do write every single day. I might take off, depends on how close to deadline I am, but I might take off one day a week just because I need the rest and I need to, you know, you want to go out for dinner or with friends or whatever. But usually too, I got to say, I probably don't feel the muse every day. <laughs> and I start writing at like around five o'clock and I write from five to nine. That's when I get most of my new stuff written. And I'm, I, I often wonder why is that? And I think part of it's procrastination. Like I keep putting it off and I really, I'm never really sure that I'm going to be able to write when I sit down, but it's getting the butt in the chair, pen and pencil in hand and just start reading what you wrote the day before. Then it happens when you start reading what you wrote the day before. It happens, even though I didn't want to go sit in that chair and I thought, I got nothing right now. I really don't feel like writing. I don't think I can write. But I always do. When Once you sit down and you put the pencil on the page or fingers to keyboard, whatever, the words will <laughs> come. But it's, it's, the, it's the discipline of getting into the chair in the first place. I think that's, that's important with writing. It's not... It's not just motivation or inspiration. It's discipline for the most part, I would say. And when you say 5 to 9, you meant 5 p.m. or 5 a.m.? 5 p.m. Oh, God. <laughs> 5 p.m. Okay. Yeah. All I'm right. A, I'm a night owl. I, I, I envy writers that kick it up at 5 and write, and then you have it all done for the day, and you can feel good. Because I always feel right? so great after I write. Like, you know, when you've written five pages or ten pages, whatever, you feel so great. And that's usually at nighttime for me and then I go to bed. But if I, and all day long, I'm kind of thinking, is it going to happen? Am I going to get it written? So I have that going on all day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it would be nice to be able to write in the morning. But I'm just, I'm a night owl. That's, and my dad was the same way. He would be up until 3 a.m. doing all this creative stuff. And then he would, he'd sleep mm. in. But I guess that's just how I'm wired. Yeah. And I think if you know what works best for you, don't fight it. Just exactly. do it. Yes, yeah. I agree. Absolutely. That's good yeah. advice. So Julianne, is there a book that you're dying to write, but you haven't just yet? No, absolutely not. Remember we were talking before about having no ideas? I got nothing. Uh, there's no no ideas out there. I'm, I'm desperately seeking ideas. I wish. Yeah. Uh, so who do you like to read? Who, who are your favorite authors? Whenever I get that question of who who is your favorite author, I find that difficult because I, I find it easier to say, what are your favorite books? Because sometimes I'll read... If you read everything an author's ever written, you like some and more than others, you know, but then there's sometimes there's this one book that just really hits it for you. And I, I'd say The Shell Seekers by Rosamund Pilcher is probably one of my all time favorite books. And uh, I, I generally find Leanne Moriarty pretty reliable. She, she never lets me down. And Jane Green, I also like her. Uh, yeah, those are all contemporary authors. But then if you go back, I probably the first book that I read that I really, that sort of, I guess, created in me this love for literature was Jane Eyre, which is an, you know, of course, an old classic. And that was the first time I read a book that I was actually really, really, well, other than when I was young reading Judy Bloom, that stuff I loved. But as sort of an, as an adult, as a, you know, a, I guess at that moment when I went from reading children's books to adult books it was that was the book that kind of awakened me to adult literature so I love that book so what would you be doing if you weren't an author not being an accountant I would guess <laughs> no, <laughs> no you know what I I really find that a hard question because I can't imagine doing anything else at this point in my life I'm, I'm now how old am I 56 I would just retire. <laughs> if, if I couldn't be an author now, I would just say, I'm all done. Um, I think if I was going to do something, I would pick a job that I could just sit in like a ticket booth and read. <laughs> and take tickets <laughs> every once in a while and someone comes sell them a ticket and then I could just sit in the booth and read. That, I would, that would be the job I would like. Yeah. What do you feel is the most gratifying thing about being an author? 
Okay, so the correct answer is, oh, writing stories that readers enjoy. And that's all lovely. But I, I got to say, I do really enjoy working from home and the autonomy of being your own boss. And there's no one hovering over your shoulder on a daily basis. There's a deadline, which looms. And that, of course, creates stress and pressure. But there's not a physical person standing over your shoulder. Like I work from 5 to 9 p.m. That's what works for me. And I'm allowed to do that. So it would really suck if I had to get up in the morning and do a job that was like 7.30 in the morning. So yeah, working from home and the autonomy of your day, like doing what you want with your day. And yeah, I think I like that a lot. Now, you mentioned that your husband reads your books and your cousin. Does your daughter also read your books? She's read a couple of them, but no, generally not. But she's so busy. She's been in university for years and she's always writing exams and studying. She doesn't have time to read fiction. So, so no. Other family members? Oh, yeah. My aunt, she's a big reader. And my cousin, my other cousin, Julia. Most family members do, I guess, because, yeah, they're supportive and everything. How consumed are you with the story when you're in the middle of, a, of writing a book? Uh, very, extremely, uh, <laughs> to a fault, where, like I said, I have to work on the work-life balance because sometimes I just, I don't want to do anything else. Like, I don't want to go out and anything that can distract me from the story. And, and that's, an, that's one of the things I don't read for pleasure. I don't read other novels when I'm in the middle of a first draft because again that distracts me from my own story world and my own characters and I will watch television I'll watch dramas and all that stuff after I'm done writing for the day and I that's sort of as much as I can do but and if I do have to read a book like sometimes I'll have to read a book like for a quote like some an author will ask for an endorsement and I'm like yeah okay and you have a deadline I will have to put my own book aside for a week or however long it takes I can't read that other author's book in the day and then write my stuff at night. It's like, okay, Mm. the whole book gets put aside, go read this other thing, and then I come back to it. Yeah, I'm very kind of focused, I guess. Is there something you wish people knew about being an author? Any misconceptions you've come up against? Hmm. I don't think I have come up against personally any misconceptions, but I think that some people might think authors are all rich, (laughs) that we all make loads of money. And that's not the case. I mean, some authors do very well, and that's great. But the majority of authors are, you know, mid-list authors or whatever, and they're not making a huge salary. And it makes me sad when when I saw like that that TikTok challenge, the read and return thing, where everybody thought, oh, we're sticking it to Amazon, where where they would read an ebook and then immediately return it and get another one. And what happens there is the author doesn't get paid. So it's the author that suffers from that. So I was really sorry. I didn't like seeing that. And I hope that that's not uh, trending now (laughs) because I think that's the thing that authors are, most authors are struggling to make a living at what they love. So I think we should support them and buy the book. Don't try to get it for free as as if it's, you know, uh, you know, authors work really hard and I think they deserve to be paid. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and f- for what most authors, especially indies, charge for an ebook, you couldn't get a latte for that amount of money. <laughs> so it's so true. It, it's befuddling to me that people would think it was okay to return a book. I don't know. I don't. I don't get that. But yeah, uh, yeah, that is very true. Anyway, um, so you mentioned this Alaska book. Is that what you're currently working on, or is that one finished? It's almost done. I'm about thirty pages away from being finished, and. My cousin is actually reading the first 275 pages right now, and I'm going to deliver the rest of it on Friday, and it's due September 30th. So, yeah, that's what I'm working on. So that's where my head is right now, still in Alaska. (laughs) Not a bad place to be. (laughs) No, beautiful. (laughs) We have reached the part of the podcast where we ask our fun extra questions that are not writing related. Are you ready for this, Julianne? I think so. Okay. The first one, what is one food that will never get past your lips? Raw onions. <laughs> I would agree with you on that one. Ugh. Who would you want to play you in a movie? Okay, if it can be dead or alive, I'm going to say young Elizabeth Taylor. What superpower would you pick, given the opportunity? I would like to fly. I think I was a bird in a previous life. <laughs> What's your biggest guilty pleasure? The Bachelor. And The Bachelorette and Bachelor in Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> 
What is the worst job you've ever had? Yeah, I, I got to say none. I can't think of a really bad job. There were jobs I didn't love. Well, being an accountant and an auditor, I didn't love. I didn't enjoy but there was nothing that I really, really hated. Even I was, you know, retail clerk. That wasn't so bad. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed every job I've ever done, really. I can't say any. I, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I got nothing on that one. Nope, that's fine. <laughs> if you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Medical stuff. I'd like to be able to cure cancer. Not going to happen, though. <laughs> I, don't have the, I don't have the brain cells for that. <laughs> What's your favorite smell? It's going to be a toss-up between lilacs and a movie theater popcorn. When you walk into the movie theater and you smell mm. popcorn. What is the most terrifying thing you've ever done? Driving on the highway in the rain, because I had a car accident once in the rain on the highway. And then after that, having to drive in the rain. Anytime I have to drive fast in the rain, I'm white-knuckled. What's one thing you're really bad at? I have a terrible, terrible sense of direction. If I'm driving, if my husband and I are out driving and we're, you know, in a neighborhood or whatever, and he says, oh, I think it's going to be left. I'm like, oh, no, no, it's right. I'm sure of it. We have to go right here. It's that way. Or if we're walking in a hike on a path, I'm insisting and I'm, I'm always wrong. So whatever I say, I tell him, do the opposite. Don't listen to me. We go whichever way you say <laughs> And our last question, if you could live your life over again, would you want to? I love, I love living. Uh, I want to say yes, but only if I could go back and uh, knowing what I know now, I'd like to go back and do it all again, knowing what I know now. But then okay. you do, you probably do things differently and then you might end up somewhere else. So at the end, I think I'm going to say no, because I don't want to end up, I like where I am right now and I would hate to mess with mess with mess with that and end up somewhere horrible well on that note <laughs> we'll, on that note we'll let you get back to alaska oh yay <laughs> going back we to it. are so thrilled to have had you uh, on and really appreciate your time and we wish you the best of luck with this new book both new books oh thank you for having me it was so great to talk to you guys thanks julianne right. hey thank you Thank you for listening to Behind the Book, brought to you by authors Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. They hope you found it entertaining and informative. If you loved it, tell your friends. And if you have a moment, they'd love for you to post a star rating or review. This has been Behind the Book. <laughs>